God gives us miraculously this clean slate, this new beginning every single minute. And the problem is, is we often live our lives beating ourselves up over whatever we perceive to be wrong or inadequate or not enough. Or we listen to other people beating us up about how we are not enough or we are somehow less than. And we start to believe it. We start to forget that the gospel actually changed everything. Just to get our heads around what a big deal the gospel is, I, I think is really hard to do because we're so limited in our human thinking. I, I'm, listen, I, things happen all the time that amaze me and I, that I can't even get my head around. One of them is, so this last week, SpaceX did this crazy thing. Can you go to the next slide? SpaceX did this crazy thing, and I don't know what you think of Elon Musk, it doesn't really matter, but what SpaceX did was sort of ridiculous. So they launched a booster rocket, part of their Starship, and it's the largest booster ever built, ever. Um, in fact, the Starship booster weighs 8 million pounds. I can't even get my head around what 8 million pounds is. And then it launched, and then it directed itself back to the launch pad and was caught in these metal arms that they call chopsticks. And I'm, my mind's blown just because my typical experience with chopsticks is I can't catch anything. <laughs> but, but this... I mean, this is remarkable. This 8 million pound thing is then caught so that it can be reused. It goes to space and back. I can't even get my head around this thing. And I think if that's so mind-bending and I can't get my head around it, what about the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Death is conquered and eternal life with God is secured. He catches us impossibly in our sin, in our death, in our despair. He catches us, he heals us, he restores us, he sets us free to relaunch into our new trajectory of life, our new life with Jesus Christ. Impossible. But that which was impossible for us to do on our own, he did for us. And this is the good news. And some of you, that's exactly the news you need to hear when you came in here this morning. Because you are beating yourself up that you feel like you're not good enough. Or you do have people in your life that are tearing you down. Or you do feel like somehow, some way, maybe along the way, you've angered God, and God thinks you're not enough. This is your reminder. None of that defines who you are. And by the way, God says you're enough. He laid down his life for you before you even knew who he was. The gospel changes everything, as we've seen in Paul's, you know, laying out of Romans. We're all the way up to chapter 8 now. But as he's been laying it out, he he very powerfully helps us to understand, it's like this life that we live, we co-live with Jesus Christ now. This is the symbolism of baptism. We co-died with Jesus as he died on the cross and paid the price for sins. We die with him. When he rose again, we rise with him. And in that way, we have new life because we participated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as he did it. And it's, of course, a huge idea that we can't really get our minds around. But this is what Paul is saying happened. This crazy new reality that really we didn't do, we have access to by grace through faith. And as we lean now into chapter 8, we watched how he closed chapter 7. He closes chapter 7 just acknowledging, I was powerless to do this on my own. In fact, he says, this is 724, what a wretched man I am, Paul says. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I cannot rescue myself. I need help. I can't do it all, no matter how hard I try. And then he, sort of in a sigh of relief, says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now he starts chapter 8. Here's verse 1, and this is another marker on our Roman road, and it's a big one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. Not from God, not from anyone else. Because we live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. As if it were our own.
it's hard to remember sometimes, especially when you're going through something. But how important to remember when God says, lovingly, he looks into your eyes and says, you are not condemned. I will not condemn you. There's nothing to condemn. You have a clean slate. When we go to God, you know, God says he remembers our sins no more. He's cap perfectly capable of remembering anything God wants. He says he remembers our sins no more. So it's like we go back to God, we say, God, sorry that I sinned again. Or sorry I did that sin again. He goes, what sin? He remembers our sins no more. We have a clean slate because of what he did on the cross for us. So as we've journeyed through the Roman road, and you're going to see, we're going to tie all these pieces together. we got two more in the road after this uh, at the end when we have our closing in our series of Romans. But this is the next one. For now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he continues, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What does he mean, the law of the Spirit? So he's not using terms like we might use today. It was a theological idea that wasn't fully fleshed out until later. It's clearly here. But he would, we would say the Holy Spirit. He's trying to say the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus somehow at work. And so he's making this dichotomy. So there's this life in this new law of the Spirit, and then there's life in the old way, or more uh, specifically death in the old way of the law of the flesh, or the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. What's that mean? What do you mean in the likeness of sinful? Well, what he's trying to say is, you don't want to say that Jesus was sinful, because that would be inaccurate. But as a human being, he was of flesh. And naturally, if a sacrifice of atonement was owed to God, God didn't owe it to himself. Humanity owed it. So Jesus needed to be both human and God. You know, only God can do what Jesus did, and only a human ought to pay the price that Jesus paid. That's why he needed to be God-human, if you will. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Wait, wait. The righteousness met in us. What's that mean? You see, when you, when you slow down and start reading the Bible, you end up with more questions. And that's a good thing. Because it really matters to pay attention to what Paul's trying to say here. So what's he saying? That the righteous requirement of the law is met in us. Because of the Holy Spirit in us. How does that work? What are the mechanics of that? The risen Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. We are forgiven. And when that happens, something changes inside of us. Some people have felt this change immediately when they put their faith in Jesus. I was one of them. Not everybody has that experience. Some people, they don't feel or perceive any change. But the change is happening whether your emotions perceive them or not. The Holy Spirit now, through Jesus, dwells within us. So the righteous requirement of the law is made in us from the inside out. Because the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. Again, another huge idea that has taken 2,000 years to unpack. What Paul is saying is, is that these are the mechanics. You have now this new spirit, the spirit of God, the law of the spirit that will be dictating your life. Or in, your, in a present in your life in a different way than it was before. We'll get to a little bit more of that in a minute. He says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live accord in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's a little nuance here that matters. So he says, The reality is the righteousness of the law is met in us by the Holy Spirit in us. However, What's he saying here? This is a little bit different. He's saying, 
those who live according to the flesh and those who live according to the Spirit. In other words, it seems like even if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you could choose at every given time, any given time, to live according to the flesh. It doesn't mean you're always living according to the Spirit. Even though the reality has changed, you, in your human nature, still may be swayed by the flesh, just like anybody else. But the difference is the flesh is not what's in charge of you. And he, he plays off this a little bit. So there's a difference between the mind that's kind of powered, fueled by the flesh, and the mind that's fueled by God. He says, the mind that is governed, next verse, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. He keeps going. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. It's verses like these that I'm just like, oh, why has it got to say that? I just want everyone to be happy. <laughs> I, I truly do. I'm a total people pleaser. Some of you people pleasers out there, you're going to agree with me because you want to please me. <laughs> but, right? It's like, I just want everyone to live a happy life and get along and, you know, let's, let's gather around the campfire. But there is a reality that it's really hard. Paul says it's not possible. It's really hard to dabble in something and also build your life around it. I don't think it's really possible to dabble in the Christian faith and see any measurable different experience of your life at all. Because you're not really doing the Christian faith. And, and I think everybody has a season in their life. You all have, we're all on different stages in our faith journey, and that's fine. And I think there is a stage where you're just sort of dabbling, like you're trying it out. Like, I don't know. What's, what's the deal with this? I met a lot of weird Christians. I don't want to be one of those. That was my experience. I'll, I'll just project that onto you. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be one of those. So what's that look like for me? But the truth is, you can't set your mind to something that you don't know. This is Paul's point. You can't set your mind on Jesus without knowing Jesus. And this is the, the big important distinction of church life, is that you could know all about Jesus and not know Jesus. In the same way that I could probably look you up on Facebook, and I could know a lot about you, scarily. That doesn't mean I know you. I don't know you at all. I think, sadly, we, we have a whole generation of Christians that know a lot about God who don't really know God. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I'm not trying to be, I'm certainly not trying to be judgmental. I'm just kind of showing a reality. Is I think a lot of people make the mistake. But you can't have your mind set on something or someone that you don't know. It's like I could be, okay, um, I'm going to be part of the next team to do the next SpaceX, you know, launch. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I can read a lot about how they captured the thing with the arms and the chopsticks and all that. But I hope they would never listen to me because I don't know what I'm talking about. I might know enough to have a conversation, but I don't know what I'm talking about because I can't have my mindset on something that I don't know. So Paul says, if you are in the flesh, if you will, if you don't have this regenerative experience of faith. And that's what it is. We believe that, you've heard the phrase born again. It's got all sorts of like baggage to it for good reason. But truly, that's what scripture says happens. We are regenerated. We are made new into the person that we were called and created to be from the inside out. And that this regenerative experience 
enables us to set our mind on Christ because now we can know him. Why? Because he dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. And, well, you probably know this to be true. You ever have, I know I've had this in my life where, you know, I have friends or family and I'll say something and they will not understand what the heck I'm talking about. Or they'll ask about, like, what's going on in my life and I'll share with them a little bit. And, and I'll get people tell me, like, why are you still smiling? Like, you're going through a really hard thing. And I'll be like, I know, it is hard. And like, are you okay? Like, as if, like, I'm not grieving enough over whatever the thing is. I say, oh, no, I'm, listen, I'm going through it. Make no mistake, but I have God with me. And it changes this roller coaster a bit. And they don't know what I'm talking about because they haven't experienced it. So it's really hard to explain to somebody what the Christian life really is. I feel like all of my words fall short in that because you don't really know until you live it. I think this is what Paul is getting at. And he says, verse 10, he continues, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. In other words, if, if the same Spirit that was in Jesus Christ is now in you, you're going to see some of the same effects of the Spirit. It's the same Spirit at work. That's why we have hope for resurrection. That's why we have hope. Because we've seen it in Jesus, and that's our hope. We've seen, Jesus was the first one. He was the pioneer of our faith, as Hebrews says. He was the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So when we look at Jesus, it's like looking into the future for us. It's like helping to understand how the Spirit can speak and work through us. Because it's the same Spirit at work. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to live to the flesh, to live, or excuse me, not to the flesh to live according to it. In other words, and this is a really important point he's making, none of what we receive in Jesus is because we did anything special. We didn't do it. God did it all for us in this whole new changed reality because of what God did. But there's a part that we play. We should be trying to live according to the Spirit. Why? Because we are so grateful to what God did for us. Because of this change that happened, it makes it possible. Let me put it this way. Before we had Jesus, go on to the next slide. We had what he would call the spirit of the flesh. Imagine uh, sitting at the steering wheel of our car. We had the spirit of the flesh driving. And when we come to faith in Jesus, we have a new spirit residing in us. A new resident spirit, if you will. The Holy Spirit. And the difference between the spirit of the flesh and the Holy Spirit is vast. Now, even though the Holy Spirit now is driving, we still can be influenced by the flesh. It just means the flesh isn't in control. The flesh isn't the final say in our lives. If it were, it would lead us to death. But instead, it leads us to life. There is someone else, you know that song, Jesus Take the Wheel. By the way, I did find a picture of all the wheels Jesus took. Um, it's really <laughs> kind of special. But, you know, <laughs> that song, Jesus Take the Wheel, I mean, that's really what that is. It's, it's, we can't change the fact, and this is good, this is the hope of the gospel. We can't change the fact that we have a new spirit residing within us. We have the Holy Spirit residing in us. But you know what happens? I think we try to co-drive. We try to grab the wheel. It's like we're reaching over. Anybody have a mother that did that when you're, when you're learning to drive? 
I'm just hypothetically. <laughs> like, we want to reach over and be like, oh, oh, yeah, I don't know. We're grabbing the handle. We have a tendency to try to get that control back because we love control, even if it doesn't lead us to a good place. It seems that we still fight for it. But it's, this is the surrender part. Yes, there's a new reality. The Holy Spirit now sits in the driver's seat of our lives. Praise God. Which makes everything possible in our new life with Christ. But now we got to keep surrendering so that we allow the Spirit to take us where he wants us to go. That's like the rest of the Christian life. So there's the regenerative. Now we got the new resident spirit within us, the Holy Spirit. And now there's the rest of the Christian life. Letting him take me where I want to go or where he wants me to go. Now watch this. He goes even deeper here. He says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves as you were to sin, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba in Aramaic translates to something really intimate like, daddy or dad and the reason that's important is nobody talked about god that way back then nobody would claim a familiarity with god that was so intimate that you could call him daddy like that's that's too that's like a little child to a father that's too intimate that would be almost blasphemous to say that and this is the way that jesus talked in prayer to his father very intimate and he says now Paul's saying now, we can be that intimate with God because he's living in us. He has adopted us as his children. I've told you this story before, but I was adopted legally when I was in high school, even though my stepfather's a father that really raised me since I was five. But it wasn't until high school that we made it official. And I thought the weirdest thing, but also the coolest thing, I was always embarrassed by my birth name and you know, every school year, I'd have to try to catch the teacher before class started because I didn't want to hear him say the wrong name, him or her say the wrong name, and then I'd have to correct it and everybody look around. It just, it was a weird feeling I didn't like. And, um, but I remember after the official court date and in the mail a few weeks later, I got my birth certificate with, with Tucker on it. And it replaced the old birth, it's as if the old birth name never even existed in the eyes of the law. And I think, isn't this what Jesus did for us? We are children of God. It's as if we have been no other than God's children all along. We have a different status in the eyes of the law. We are forgiven. We are made clean. We are this new creation. Adopted. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, now follow Paul's logic. Now, if we are our children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So, let's tie the, the bow on this. We co-die with Christ, we co-rise with Christ, we're co-heirs with Christ. We are fellow brothers and sisters of Christ. We are heirs of the same glorious inheritance of life forever with our Abba Father. Now, why adopted? What's that mean? Aren't we all God, God's children? Well, adopted because think about this theologically. What made Jesus different than you and me? <laughs> Lots. But what made Jesus different than you and me? Because he was the only one who was naturally born like this, naturally born righteous, naturally born in obedience to the Father. He didn't need any forgiving. That was not a problem for him. He was the one naturally like that, so we're all adopted to be like that by the grace that he gives to us. Because the standard of righteousness is Jesus. 
And the only way we meet that standard is through his forgiveness. And so watch what Paul does here. So Paul's basically like, okay, so if this is all true, what in the world will I ever need to worry about in my life? I mean, really. He even says, I consider that our present sufferings, and he was going through some suffering, there, and there was some early persecution of churches during this time. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And the Spirit's walking with us every step of the way. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Like even when you are in such a bad place, you don't even know what to say to God. God says it for you. That's how much God is for you. His child. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know, and this is one of those highlight in your Bible ones, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. I didn't say works for the easier. Works for the good. Who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't know what challenge you're facing or, or what you feel is against you today. It's usually like a situation at work, but it could be with your kids, could be with your family, could be, who knows. If God is for you, who could be against you? If God is for you, you have everything you will ever need, full stop. Not only that, as you go through the things you go through, he is with you every step of the way. When you don't know what to pray, he's praying for you. When you don't know what to do, he's, he's helping you take steps. You surrender control, he's going to take the car where it's supposed to go. And then he comes full circle. Remember how he started? There's no condemnation. And now he says, now in light of all this, who then, verse 34, is the one who condemns? Who's left to condemn if God's not going to condemn us? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and, is all, and also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword... Now watch this. This is great. So um, our Princeton Seminary intern, Megan, she preached at the 845. And I love something she said, and I'm going to steal it from her right now. She said, the next, what happens next is Paul's mic drop. I love that. Because it is. And he probably could have ended the letter right here. He says, No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing, life, death, whatever, whatever you can throw at the love of God, it shall not separate us. If that isn't security for the rest of your life, I don't know what is. Our three questions, what does it say, what does it mean, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? Once the Holy Spirit is residing in you, nothing can separate us. If God is for you, who can be against you? Listen. Maybe your life right now feels like the weight of eight million pounds. Maybe it does. Maybe you have something in your life that feels every bit like that. This is the good news. 
Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That we're to cast our burdens upon him because he can handle it. If you let him, God will catch you and heal you and relaunch you into freedom of this new life. Haven't you had enough of living with all that weight on your shoulders? Maybe it's time for you. Maybe it's time for you to trust, to know Jesus, or to remember Jesus. Because we do a lot of forgetting as soon as we walk out the doors. But make no mistake, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.